Hello and welcome to Securities Lending Saturday. I'm Roy Zimmer Hansel and I'm your host. Today I'm going to be talking about dividend arbitrage and securities lending. So we're going to explore this relatively uh, complex or at least controversial area. And I'll talk to you about it live today. So if you are in securities lending or it's something that's of interest to you, then this is the place for you. So let's get to it. everyone. Uh, welcome to another Saturday. This is week 21. As I said, I'm Roy Zimmer Hansel. Today, I'm going to talk about dividend arbitrage. So dividend arbitrage itself is a trading strategy and <clears throat> it's a normal part of the business. So what I'm going to explore today is something along those lines, a little bit different and directly related to securities lending. Uh, hello V. Great to see you. Thanks for joining me again this Saturday. Hope it's been a great week. Okay. As I said, we have been here for 21 weeks, uh, well, 20 weeks, and then one week out for technical problems. Today, we're talking about dividend arbitrage as it relates to securities lending. And next week, we're going to be talking about ESG. Can you imagine I've gone five months without really talking about ESG? You can't go a minute without hearing something about ESG these days. So I'm going to fix that next week. Anyway, that's for next week. So we're going to talk about dividend arbitrage. What is it? I'm going to talk about the pre and post awareness. What I'm referring to is tax authorities being aware of the potential for abuse of their tax regulations. We'll talk about the test that many tax regulators actually formally or informally use to assess whether people can benefit from withholding tax reductions. And then <clears throat> I'm also going to talk about the Cumex scandal, which as the name suggests is a bit of a scandal. So I will refer to that and give you somewhere to look up some more information on that. So that's the topic. As always, this is for informational and entertainment purposes only. It is, as a little flashing bit said earlier on, it is not tax advice. Always talk to a professional before doing anything and securities lending and markets in general qualify within that. Don't do anything unless you've spoken with an expert and understand fully what it is you're doing. I'm going to start with a recap on what happens with securities lending. Okay. And then we'll go into the rest of the dialogue today. Remember that an investor that holds assets that normally expects dividends and interest payments. If you said to them, I can pay you some fees in securities lending, but you have to give those up or you're going to get a reduction in that. Then of course, they're not going to participate because getting dividends and interest is a core part of the investment process. So they're not going to give up on it. So I've highlighted two things here. So number one, the key principle, the core expectation is that an investor participating in securities lending has to be in the same place after doing lending as they would have been before doing lending with respect to any of their entitlements like dividends and interest payments. I'm just gonna remove that um, caption because although you're welcome to uh, Securities Lending Saturday, I don't really want it to block the page. Hopefully that's a little bit more clear and thanks, thanks for the person that mentioned that to me. So number one, before and after should be the same. That's the idea of this picture. And this other box here that I've highlighted near the bottom, of course, they're not really the same before and after, because of course a lender also gets fees. So two lenders, one that lends one or two investors, one that lends one that doesn't lend, they'll both end up with the same entitlement structure but, and compensation, but the one that's lending, of course, is earning fees as well. So of course, a lending investor is better off financially. And of course they carry an element of risk with that. And again, you can look at the risk video that I did previously, two of them talking about the different risks involved. Again, in my opinion, a low risk business, but always understand the risk before you do it. So before, after. That's the equivalent. As always with these videos, if, if you get value from them, if you think that they help, that's great. 
give me a thumbs up or a like or whatever is the equivalent on the platform you're watching it on. And if you want to hear about other videos as they become available, then hit the subscribe button on YouTube and you'll get notified every time I do a video. Right now I'm doing them one a week. This is dividend arbitrage in the conventional sense. So forget about securities lending. There is a, a strategy which involves both options and the physical stock, where what you do is you buy X number of shares of a stock. You also purchase put options so that I have a long position in the equities, and I also have the option to put those shares onto someone else. So effectively, I have a flat position in that stock. And so then it just becomes a question of how much dividend do I make versus how much uh, does the put option cost me to buy? And if it's a low volatility uh, stock, then that should be cheaper than a higher volatility stock as with all options. And so the idea is you hold it for a very short period of time, you capture the real dividend, and you can lay off the stock at an economic price. And it's just about the calculation. So it, as it says there, it's about trying to create a risk-free or near risk-free transaction by hedging the security component and capturing the dividend. And you can go to Investopedia where I got that explanation. That is not what we're talking about when it comes to uh, securities lending and dividend arbitrage. So if, if you go anywhere and <clears throat> people talk about dividend arbitrage, typically they're talking about this trading strategy. So if that's what we're not talking about, then what are we going to be talking about? I, I would refer to it more as <clears throat> withholding tax arbitrage. What I'm trying to do is see one or more investors, long or short, who have different withholding tax rates. And I try to take advantage of those differentials to eke out additional uh, profits. Okay. So that's the idea. You're looking at different withholding taxes, trying to exploit gaps in that. And of course, try to do it legally. If you don't do it legally, that's what, you, that's what leads on to the scandal, which I'll talk about later. Okay. So again, a, a second part of the recap, but this is really super important. This is what we talked about in the last video. So if you haven't watched the last video, I'll put a link into this so that you can just connect directly to that video. But again, here we have three investors. We have a tax exempt one on top, one investor that gets some kind of treaty relief through a double taxation treaty between their country and the country of the company that's paying the dividend. And then you have the most tax disadvantaged investor because the middle one is a little bit tax disadvantaged. The bottom one is completely tax disadvantaged, doesn't get any kind of benefits. They just get the basic amount of net dividend. Remember what I was saying in last week or for the first time, for those of you watching it for the first time, if you start with the same dividend in Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, then that $1.50 starting point is the same for all investors. Then they suffer varying degrees of withholding tax from zero to say 25%, which is usually the maximum. And this green amount is the amount that the borrower has to pay to the lender to make certain that they're in an equivalent position as to the beginning of uh, the transaction. So they had Coca-Cola shares, had they not lent it out, if they're tax exempt, that $1.50 dividend would have turned into $1.50 of real cash and the changes for the other entity. So a tax disadvantaged who can't benefit from any relief, that $1.50 dividend ends up uh, $1.12 and a half. Okay. Now a borrower, just looking at that, since they're the ones that have to pay this equivalent amount in that end column, of course, they're going to try and find lenders with the cheapest amount. So that's where they're going to go to borrow if they can, right? That one right there, because it's just cheaper, right? They're saving versus a tax exempt entity. They're saving 37 and a half cents a share, and that can be quite a lot of money. Okay. So that's in, that's what happens every day with securities lending transactions and, and dividends. Now let's look at what happens when you get involved with tax authorities and the withholding tax and how this actually works out. So imagine a German company here pays a dividend. Structurally, it usually goes through the depository or clearing center that records electronically who holds which shares, and that gets distributed to the custodian. 
the custodian is the one that knows who the underlying investors are that hold those shares. And then they will, in a tax reclaim market, they will deduct the maximum amount of withholding tax that the local tax authority says must be submitted. So in this example, 25% uh, of the dividend goes to the fiscal authority. And then the investors or their agents or service providers, they might, based on their tax entitlement, make representations to the fiscal authority to say, hey, I'm entitled to a reclaim of some or all of that dividend. Okay, but just the starting point here, company pays the dividend, custodian gets it, gives it to an investor in the UK, gives it to a German investor who, because of their structure of their fund, might be tax exempt, or they give it to someone in a tax haven who has no double taxation treaty benefits. They all start off with the same amount and then these entities where they're entitled, if they're entitled, they might make a representation to the fiscal authority to say, give me some of it back, please, because of my entitlement. And so after some time, which might be months, might be years, in the case, in some examples in the 90s, it was never by some of the tax authority, but that's, that's a different story. And so in this example, I've said a UK investor holding a German stock might be entitled to 10% of that uh, withholding tax back. So out of the 25%, the fiscal authority keeps a net 15. And if someone is completely tax exempt, they get 25% of it. They get that full dollar 50 if it was a German stock. So that's maybe a bad example, but they don't suffer any withholding tax. Of course, this entity in the tax, ha in the tax haven jurisdiction, they don't have any double taxation treaty benefits. And so they just have to be happy with their 75%. All right. Now in the pre-awareness days. So what I mean by pre-awareness is tax authorities really didn't spend too much time in the old days looking at who owned shares, why people were entitled. They just made certain that the paperwork was correct. And if the paperwork was correct, they re they paid the reclaimed withholding tax and they didn't really act on or investigate further in terms of how did an investor come to be an investor in that stock? How long were they an investor? They didn't really care. It was all about just processing it as was a custom. This really, and it's hard to put a dividing line, but this is really, if you want to broadly look at it, this is in the pre-2000, year 2000 era, okay? And what people were doing in the 90s and 80s is what you could do is just borrow stock from this entity that suffered maximum withholding tax, who would only get 75% of the dividend and borrow it from them and lend it to someone that actually was entitled to the full tax relief. So in this example, this tax exempt entity, and they would be able to claim the full dividend. So they're getting a hundred. This entity only needs 75 to put them back into the position they were in had they not been lending. So that's 25% of the dividend that these three parties could share between themselves. So you can question that. You can say, was that legal? Well, that was not illegal. And that's, that's the way the world was then. If it wasn't illegal, then people assumed it was legal. If people were doing illegal things, you would expect them to be pursued by the tax authorities or the legal authorities. And that wasn't the case. And so this happened for an extended period of time. Okay. Then around 2000, tax authorities started realizing that what would happen is they would see big swings of investors. They would have a lot of foreign investors during a, sorry, before a dividend date, right? Remember there's, there's three dates that are really important for a dividend. One is the X date, which means anyone that owns it as of that date is entitled. Sorry, let me stop again. You have the X date. Okay. So people that have traded those positions as of that date, right before and after you're actually entitled to the, the dividend or you're not entitled to the dividend. You have the record day where they do the snapshot of who the holders are, and that's what the entitlement is based on. And then you have the pay date, which is when the dividend gets paid. And so what they were seeing was there would be a lot of foreigners holding the shares before the X date, before the record date. And then all of a sudden, there would be this huge swing 
to domestic investor over the dividend period. And then it, after the dividend was paid, it would revert back to a large holding by foreigners. And so they realized, why would that be? Of course, the only difference is the amount of withholding tax that foreigners versus domestic entities uh, were entitled to. And so they investigated to it and, and they started putting in new rules and they started looking at how can we avoid false trading? How can we avoid people doing transactions, not necessarily even trades, but transactions that were driven purely by this tax differential? So once you get into the post awareness, you get into uh, what we call the post anti avoidance days. Tax authorities really want to focus on the true economic ownership. So in that example that I just gave, if you had a bunch of foreign investors that then switch into domestic investors and back into those same foreign investors, clearly there's only a temporary switch and that's not really a true reflection of the economic ownership of those assets. So the tax authorities, the fiscal authorities became very cognizant of what the drivers were, what the shifts were, and who the true ownership of those positions belonged to. Okay. So that was, that became their key drivers. So we don't want to see any of this temporary switching because if it's temporary, then by definition, it's not real. And so if it's not real, you shouldn't be entitled to any withholding tax. But they also wanted to recognize that if people, if foreigners and domestic participants, if they were doing genuine transactions that could benefit from withholding tax differentials, then that would be also accommodated for. So it wasn't just about stopping any potential abuse from temporary transfers. It was also recognizing that there were those who, that there were those who would be entitled to it based on their tax structure. And so I'm not certain who the LinkedIn uh, user is there that said, in fact, I'll just quickly show that anyway, because it, it's a good point to make. So you can see what they've said here is early 2000 tax rules were not black and white. It was a very gray area. Look, I would argue that tax rules are still pretty gray, but I would agree a hundred percent that, that that clarity has come along over time. So there was a time when people didn't really understand it or recognize it. Then there was a period where tax authorities started to recognize it and, and view it and start putting in rules and regulations. And then it's a matter of putting that into practice, testing it, regulating it, enacting it, and then processing any reclaim subsequently. So that's really an excellent point. So thanks. Thanks very much for making that. Okay. So that's where it is. Now, how do they check? How do they check in this post-awareness stage? So I guess there's really three different things they want to look at. And one is, is this a real trade or is it really just a loan? Is it back to what I described in the nineties where I could just borrow it from someone who's tax disadvantaged, lend it to someone who's tax advantaged, and we could all just split the profits away. And then after the dividend, it would all just unwind. That was, that's not a real trade. There's no trade in that. That's a series of loans or borrows, depending on your perspective. So if it's not a real trade. Don't think that you're going to get any withholding tax back. The second question is, would the trade be viable without any of these tax savings? So would you have done this trade anyway? If there was no withholding tax involved, would you have done this trade anyway? If the answer to that is yes, then it's a genuine trade, arguably. It, it's a real trade because I don't need the profitability of the tax to drive my decision to make that trade. If, if the answer is yes, I would do it, then there's, then it's acceptable for me to make extra profit by being smart with my sourcing and destination of securities. So long as whoever's making the tax reclaim that says I'm entitled to a reduced amount of withholding tax or no withholding tax at all, as long as they can satisfy all of these answers, then they have a strong case as to their entitlement. And if you can answer all of the questions successfully, then you can make extra profit because you would have done that trade and I can save extra money. And then the final position, is there a real risk created by that trade? Because I can make a trade look like a trade. I can do a purchase and a sale and a derivative contract, and I can do all of those sorts of things. And I can look like there's a stock exchange trade. I can make it look like there's several stock exchange trades, 
But if I'm not really ever at risk because it's a looping circle of offsetting transactions, then that's not really a trade either. If there's no element of risk, if there's no way that I can possibly lose money, then it's not a real trade either. Okay, so is there a real risk position? It doesn't, it doesn't say there has to be a big, it doesn't have to, there's no threshold for the amount of risk. It's subject to interpretation. Remember, all of this is about making a withholding tax reclaim or reduction uh, representation to a tax authority who always has the right to say no. So there is, there are no guarantees in life. So black and white doesn't just apply to the tax rules. They also apply to the application of tax rules. So is it a real trade? So if you can say it's a real trade, that real trade creates real risk. And I would have done the trade anyway, without any tax savings, then you have a pretty strong case to to support your view that I'm entitled to, or your claim that you're entitled to a withholding tax reduction and therefore additional profitability to the trade. Okay. And just as a final point there, I think I should just say that, um, saying maybe I've uh, given you three tick boxes here. Yes, no. And maybe uh, giving maybe is not really an acceptable uh, answer. You wouldn't do the trade unless you were confident you could satisfy each of those conditions. Okay. I hope that makes sense. And yeah. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. So practically that's what happens in security selling. You're allowed to do that, right? I wrote a blog post, which I'll also include a link to probably in the show notes where I actually explore this in a little bit more and you know, feel free to feel free to read that one. I'll put that in the show notes, as I said, now, let me turn to the Comex scandal after I take a pause because my throat. So the Comex scandal. So come means with dividend X means without dividend. And there's questions about trading around it. And really it's, it all revolves around the alleged abuse of tax rules where multiple parties we're making the same withholding tax claim reimbursement. Okay. So what you've got there is any one of these investors, imagine, uh, let me just go back on the screen to these three parties. Okay. So imagine these are just three different investors and somehow between them, they colluded so that all three of them would make a withholding tax reclaim on this one dividend stock or maybe not all three, maybe just two of them, but anyway, more than one entity. Of course, there is only one real dividend and it only gets paid out to one of these entities and the withholding tax reduction entitlement is dependent on whoever is entitled to get it. Right. And that's where you go through the process of saying, no, this, I can prove to you that this is mine, Mr. Tax authority or Ms. Tax authority. This is my asset. I'm entitled to the reclaim, pay me back. But if all three of them are making a withholding tax claim reduction on the same long position of stock, because they have moved the securities or failed to move the securities between themselves or arrange transactions in such a way that individually they could produce tax reclaim requests but it was all artificial and constructed you can be pretty clear that there is only one dividend only one entity should be entitled to the withholding tax reduction so the idea is it's an abuse of tax rules because more than one entity was making a claim for the same withholding tax reimbursement arguably some of the people have said no actually it's a legitimate claim because there's a loophole there's a gap in the regulations and we simply exploited that. <clears throat> That's the contra argument. Look, the impact of this, which is really driven largely by Germany, but also in, in other countries, the impact has been numerous bank raids and not just banks, but also intermediaries and investors and tax advisors. Lots of people have been uh, raided by the police. The outcome of it is there've been a series of court cases. There've been some convictions, which include imprisonment and some pretty hefty fines. So that's been the impact so far. Now it's really interesting because the, the internal structure of the markets, the actual operating functionality of it in markets like Germany, it really hasn't been possible to abuse the system be for many years. And the cases now date back to when it was still possible to do it.
So structurally, I don't think that there is much more scope for for abuse in this way. Although, you know, look, true, truthfully, fraudsters are frauds and people will always look for opportunities to make money legal or near the line of the regulation in that kind of gray area. And you take a view as to whether you're willing to take the risk that you're wrong or inevitably humans being humans, there's always going to be some who go too far. So uh, the rules have changed. The regulations of processing have changed in really just about every market, potentially all opportunities for people to try and circumvent the rules, but that's true with any aspect of life, not just securities lending dividends. Right now, there's still ongoing court cases. There's more that are expected. What I want to do is draw your attention to the European Banking uh, Association report into dividend arbitrage, and there's a link there for you, oops, for you to, to connect to it again. That'll be available in the YouTube video, which will be available from tomorrow. You'll be able to link on that if it's too much, or you can just look up EBA inquiry into dividend arbitrage or words to that effect, and you can find lots of material. Now, the interesting thing to me about that report is that they didn't say it was illegal because it's not illegal. How people act in the transactions, whether they can pass those tests, whether they make valid claims or not, that's where you get into the area of illegality. So what the EBA recommended is that the tax authorities work with effectively the capital markets authorities and governments in each of the European countries over which they have sway to look and see whether there was any potential for abuse or misuse and rectify those by working together. And that kind of ongoing work is not just happening in Europe. Australia has been concerned about these sorts of issues for many years, and there are other countries as well. So look, the Cumex scandal is really big. It is having a, a meaningful impact in people's actions, reactions, and attitudes. I think though, the takeaway is that Dividend arbitrage, as we're talking about here, is not illegal. It's not something that you have to worry about other than to ensure that you're complying with the relevant tax regulations. And if you're really excited about this, you can go into the Cumex files, which is a website and, and a whole series of investigations by numerous newspapers and other informants, and you can find out all about it. It's a pretty harrowing story, to be honest with you. I invite you, if you're interested, to learn more about the Cumex scandal. Go into there. Bloomberg and the Financial Times, they all do great uh, coverage of the ongoing legal cases, so there's plenty of material uh, for you to look at. So the bottom line is that borrowers can legally direct loans to lenders that are tax disadvantaged. That's not arbitrage. That's just saving money. Borrowers may be able to benefit from withholding tax reductions. Remember the test that I set out. Is it real? Is there risk? Would you have done the trade anyway? Those are the three tests. And if you satisfy that, in theory, your tax advisors will tell you that you are entitled to that. If you can't satisfy that, good luck. You're open to uh, a lot of challenge there. And if people think it's an egregious misuse, uh, you could find yourself speaking to, to the police. And that uh, clearly that multiple tax reclaims on the same tax holding is a sign of potential abuse and is going to flag things up immediately. And look, I think the really interesting thing that came out of the EBA report and many other uh, subsequent documents is that what they want is they want this kind of tax abuse to be traded in the same way as uh, terrorist financing, right? That's how serious this is. Okay? It's, a, it's a big deal. This is not just some kind of civil fine in their eyes. This is the big time. Okay. So here we go. Here's the, uh, here's the pitch on the courses. Again, I've had loads, I've had loads of the subscribers on this sign up to the free primer. I, I hope that's been really helpful for you that have taken it. This course I'm in the middle of teaching live right now. The final week of teaching is this coming week. After that's done, I'm going to be turning it into an online on demand course with some degree of live support. So you can do Q and A. So if you're interested and what I try to do there is to kind of bridge the gap between what happens in equity markets, bond market and asset management, and how does that cross over into securities lending? So rather than deal with equity markets as equity markets and securities lending as securities lending, I bridge the gap 
and then focus on securities lending. So if you, if you need to learn or are interested in learning a little bit about equities and bonds and asset management, then you might benefit from it. And then of course, there's the big daddy, which is the introduction to securities lending, which is actually an intermediate introduction to securities lending. So you will end up being uh, pretty well versed across the board in that full online course also carries CPD credits. Okay. And that's online on right. demand. The wrap up for today, the dividend arbitrage that we're talking about here, where we're really, you know, what is it? We're talking about withholding taxes that have an impact on the borrowers, the cost of borrowing and who they choose to transact with. And inevitably borrowers who are required to pay money out will look to mitigate those costs wherever possible, or if it's practical or not, that there's this kind of change of C around the turn of the century. And, and obviously I can't put an exact date on it because there's tax authorities in every country and some were more aware of it, some were less aware of it. So it's really this kind of ongoing continuum where tax authorities become more sophisticated on this particular very narrow subject. And just about everyone has put in anti-tax avoidance regulations, which set out new requirements and expectations before they're going to be making withholding tax reduction payments. The test, the test again, see if I can get it right this time, it's, is this a real trade or temporary? Does it carry real risk or is it just an arranged transaction? And the third one is, would I have done the trade without the benefit of the withholding tax. If I would have done that, I can clearly say I would have done this. This is a real trade. I would have made money on it. I'd like to claim because I'm very clever. I'd like to claim some additional withholding tax uh, related savings from it. And I should be entitled to do that because I'm a good. And then finally the come scandal. Some people have been convicted of tax abuse and some pretty heavy fines. That's not over yet, but remember that the investors and their intermediaries and everyone in the process. There are rules to follow if you act properly and follow those rules and regulations and have a proper conduct, you can benefit economically if you follow those rules. So there's nothing to be afraid of. You either are complying or you're not complying. And if you're not complying, people are looking for you. So that's it for this week. Next week, I'm going to be talking about ESG. As I said, it's been a long time since, since I've been running these things. So you have five months. And I haven't really mentioned ES tomorrow. I'm going to break that chain tomorrow, next Saturday. These are some of the topics I'll be talking about. So short selling, voting, taxation, sustainability, governance, and transparency. I hope you can join me for that. Thanks very much for spending your time either live or on replay. Again, if you're interested in seeing other videos, please put that in the comment and or thumbs up or whatever, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. Anyway, that's it. Hope you have a great Saturday. Hope you have a great weekend, a great week, and I hope to see you next Saturday. Thanks. Mm -hmm.